everyone, and, and thanks for joining me uh, today for this session uh, where I'm going to talk a bit about my experience with <coughs> uh, VSE to ZOS conversion project, which took place over, over a period of uh, several years, um, uh, ending in 2018. Um, I, I was inspired to do this session by uh, another VSE to ZOS conversion session at last year's workshop. Uh, and it was a very different experience um, uh, th than we went through. There, there was a much smaller customer, and they went from uh, an unsupported version of the uh, VSE to an unsupported version of ZOS, and it was a much, uh, a, a much more kind of compact uh, conversion. And it sounded like that they, they weren't having to service uh, the, the the kind of production workload that we were doing. But I, I thought it would be interesting to bring another perspective on this. So um, <clears throat> I know I went through this with my presentation yesterday, but uh, I'm going to quickly run through my background as well because. As you saw the subtitle, this is a relative mainframe newbie's uh, experience of a, a, a VSC to ZOS conversion. And since since uh, I, I hadn't been working on the mainframe for very long, I just wanted to go through this a little bit again. So began my career in IT in 2002, <clears throat> working just frontline help desk work. But that was where I got my introduction to, to Linux um, and, uh, and, and was able to, to kind of really start uh, honing those skills. Uh, and then moved into... Um, Systems administration in uh, 2005, uh, and 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 worked in systems administration for several years. Um, uh, following that, I, uh, I I did a lot of a lot of work. Really, kind of uh, uh, this is where where I guess I, I developed my Linux skills uh, by by kind of being thrown into different environments um, and and kind of got exposure uh, from the desktop end, moving into the the kind of the back end of, of things. Uh, in 2007, I started working in, in forensics. Uh, very interesting career uh, choice, and uh, and 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 uh, part of the um, part of, part of the the industry to work in because you have a very different skill set that you need to develop to to face the challenges of of analyzing the the evidence and and producing that sort of stuff uh, to to assist the the uh, the law enforcement and. Um, a discovery process for the courts. So, so it's it's a, it was a fascinating part of my career, but not something that something that I'm glad I'm, I'm I'm I did, but I'm I'm no longer in because uh, yeah, you get to see some 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 challenging stuff in that side of the world. Uh, in 2013, after I moved to the states, I, uh, I ended up uh, working on uh, the mainframe. I, I started working at America First Credit Union in 2013 as um, a, a Z Linux Systems Administrator, and then moved into a, ma a mainframe systems programming uh, position. Uh, within a couple of years, um, but uh, but the mainframe was a real revelation to me, and I, I wouldn't want to work anywhere else. And uh, that we had had we had this yesterday. It was uh, it was kind of kind of made distributed systems slight slightly dead to me. Um, a little bit of background about America First Credit Union, uh, founded in 1939 as Fort Douglas Civilians Employees Credit Union. Uh, it, we're a, a member owned organization. We have members, not customers. And uh, we are the sixth largest credit union by members. Uh, we just hit a million members last year, which was a big milestone for us. Um, and then uh, we're the ninth largest credit union by assets. And we're, we're currently hovering around $12 billion in assets. Um, uh, we just hit $10 billion for the first time last year. So uh, some big milestones hit in the last couple of years uh, for us, um, including expansion into, into other regions. Historically, we've been a, a Utah based organization. That's, that's where we, we were founded. And for the vast majority of our history, where we've operated, uh, we moved into Nevada within the last, last decade, maybe a little bit longer, the, uh, longer ago than that. Um, and, uh, have a decent amount of operations there and, and our expansions have always come through mergers. Uh, and the way that credit unions operate is, is we, we can't go and set up shop anywhere that we like and just open a branch and start servicing members. Uh, we have a defined field of membership that is defined by our regulator, the, the National Credit Union Association or NCUA. And they, they've approached us over time, particularly during the ec economic downtime, uh, to uh, uh, take over credit unions or mer they call them mergers, but, but essentially help credit unions that, that are in financial trouble. And we have have taken a very um, cautious financial approach to to uh, things like investments and that sort of thing, um, and, and and maintained a lot of stability even through the economic downturn uh, of, of of the mid two thousands. Uh, we we had no layoffs um, and uh, no no, uh, no furloughs, no, nothing like that. We've uh, we've always kind of been very careful to to watch uh, our, our financial position. So um, that's kind of helped our expansion into these other other regions in Idaho, Oregon. Arizona and New Mexico. 
So um, a little bit about the mainframe at, at the credit union. Um, a lot of the time we'll, we'll get approached by like an ISV or even uh, some business unit in IBM that we, we haven't dealt with too much in the past. And they'll be like, well, you're a new mainframe customer, aren't you? Nah, uh, not really. Uh, we've we've been on the mainframe. We're a new ZOS customer. We like to clarify that to them because we're not a new mainframe customer. Customer, we love the mainframe at, at the credit union. Uh, our first uh, mainframe was a uh, three seventy one forty five, uh, and we got that on site in, in nineteen seventy nine. Um, we were a DOS, DOS VS, VSC, and VM shop for, for many many years, um, and that's where our core application, which is called Talon, uh, was developed. Originally, it was developed by EDS, um, and then uh, not too too long into its life, uh, the credit union was the primary customer. The Amer America First credit union was the primary customer. Uh, so we they they were either going to discontinue the project pr product or, or or sell it. So we ended up buying the the product. So we own the source code to it, and we have several of the original developers uh, still on staff or or contracting to us. Uh, who've who've been with the product pretty much its entire life. So so on site knowledge of the the product, both with those people who started with it and then those who've taken over those responsibilities over the years is 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 unparalleled in in my experience. Um, we did have a CMS based development environment. Uh, it was it was made up of a bunch of Rex execs and a couple of assembler modules to do different different tasks and uh, it was it was a, a really a really great environment but as it grew as the the number of developers that we had grew uh, and just just FYI you can see the little screenshot there those of you who are familiar yes our, our developers despite the fact that we we did try some some uh, IDEs back then um and we're kind of full blown IDE now uh, our developers spent most of their day in in xedit uh, which is um fairly unique i remember in, in uh, the the 2014 workshop, uh, I I did the two day velocity workshop before that because we were a velocity customer at the time, and Barton uh, said, "Who here has CMS users?" And I think I was one of maybe two in a room of 25 people to raise my hand, and I, I internally gave myself uh, the the uh, the title of youngest CMS administrator currently working. Um, who knows if that's true? It was just just my little made up fiction. But anyway, um, we had uh, as that environment grew. Uh, it was it was it got kind of scary because there was one process I, I believe it was the compile process that accessed a mini disk that in read write mode, and on more than one occasion uh, that would be accessed in read write mode by uh, developers at the same time, and it would cor corrupt the VTOC. And, and there really is no scarier moment than than when I had to first format that disk containing forty years of source code and and bring it back from a thirty five ninety tape. That was uh, that was a scary moment for sure. So a little bit about Linux. Uh, Linux uh, in, at the credit union first went into production in 2004. Uh, uh, we, our ATM system uh, migrated onto Linux, and uh, and and we we run that that ATM system up until the current day. Actually, we're, we're presently in uh, in the process of reevaluating and actually replacing that system now. But uh, we, we're really hopeful that at least a large component of it will remain on Linux on Z. Um, the the ATMs department, uh, they're not Linux uh, Linux on Z systems administrators. They're, they're ATM administrators, application admins, and they've been very happy uh, with with the the both the, the the support that they get from our department and and also the the uh, power and and uh, ability that they get from running on Linux on Z. So um, we're we're really happy that we're going to retain their business at least in uh, for a large part of that infrastructure. So. Uh, as I mentioned, this is this is about a uh, a conversion project that we went through. Uh, so I'm just going to run through a quick, uh, a quick a quick um, example. Of, well, some details of of our pre-conversion architecture. So before we converted, we were on, running on a, an EC12 uh, model 703 because we needed the big processors uh, for our, our, our VSE workload, which was a very heavy transaction workload, um, running running quite heavily during the day. We would we, we would see commonly see 80 to 90% CPU utilization across two CPs. Um, and uh, we had four IFLs uh, running uh, a series of, uh, we were on VSE 5C running a series of Linux workloads. And we ran in four ZVML pass, uh, essentially two SSI clusters, one for test, one for production, with two active members for production, the production works, uh, uh, the production data center, and two uh, inactive members that we would use that were defined to the cluster, but we'd use for, for our disaster recovery. 
Um, and uh, we were running on uh, SLEDS 11, uh, SP4 for the most part. Um, in fact, I think entirely at this point. And as I said, VSE uh, 5.2. We, we kind of froze the version of VSE that we were running. Uh, we, we didn't apply. We kind of, we would say VSE 5.2 with patches to 5.3, I think is what they would say. Uh, or maybe it's 5.1 with patches to 5.2. But anyway. Uh, we didn't we didn't want to make major changes during this this conversion project because we were worried about underlying subsystems changing and and maybe maybe affecting the stability of our workload and as as many of us who had pre, who had, who were continuing to support the production environment were also uh, neck deep in the conversion project we didn't want to kind of introduce that that instability risk to 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 either uh, affect the quality of service that we're providing to the members or um, uh, extend the project time. Uh, so a little bit about the physical connections. We had a pair of FICON connections. I think there were eight gig FICON to a, a DS8870 disk subsystem. <clears throat> and then uh, one gig OSAs, fiber OSAs, uh, going to Cisco Nexus switch gear. And then we also had, uh, we heard from Optica yesterday, we had the, the Optica Prism devices and Optica uh, SCON to, to FICON conversion devices, uh, which were connected to a pair of 3590A60 tape controllers. We actually added that second one fairly late on because we were running into some SCSI problems with the uh, the, the single. We realized we had a single point of failure with that A60, so we we, we added a second one and kind of clustered, clustered those uh, as best we could. And then 3590 physical tape drives, which were heavily involved with both the uh, backup and archive procedures that we we ran on VSC and also the uh, and, and CMS, in fact, and also the um, the nightly job schedule was very heavy, heavily reliant on on uh, tape input and output. So uh, we were a, a physical tape shop right right up until conversion night on on t in twenty eighteen. But um, this this was our architecture before we got started. But let's talk now a little bit about why we decided to reconsider. We were a happy VSE customer. We've been running VSE for decades, and it had served our needs absolutely flawlessly. Um, you know, with the exception of the, the the usual things that you run into with any kind of computing. Um, but but one of the big uh, requirements that we started running into was we, we realized that at, we were a growing organization. And I've got a ch couple of charts that kind of illustrate that. Uh, so uh, this is this is right after the conversion, but it, it's it's illustrative of the conversion period as well. Uh, between the December of 2009 and December of 2019, our, our membership pretty much doubled. In December 2019, we had 521,094 members. Uh, and by December 2019, we were at 1,089,451 members. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a significant growth in membership. And there was a, a correlate growth in transactions as well. This is just uh, th this is just taken from some of our statistics from our ATM and, and point of sales uh, system. Our, our ATM's department um, puts out these holiday statistics every year, so they were easily accessible to me. But just for for for, for perspective, our ATM's PO system isn't even our heaviest hitter in, in terms of transactional load. Uh, that would be our, our, our MQ and message broker environment, which uh, which is is the the, the middleware for um, our uh, mo mobile online banking and uh, teller system, also with a, a variety of internal systems as well that come through those web web services, and they're frequently in the millions of transactions per day. But this this is a snapshot of our ATMs and POS transactions uh, on Black Friday. And in on Black Friday 2009, uh, we had 410,746 ATM and POS transactions. By 2019, that had more than doubled to 860,844 transactions. So it was, uh, it, as you can see, we're, we're a growing organization. And a, as a result of that, uh, the demand for our systems is, is rapidly growing as well. And there's all sorts of uh, different new features and that sort of thing that, that, that have contributed to that growth as well. So some more reasons. Um, we were a heavy MQ for VSE uh, shop, and we were very, very happy with with that product and and the uh, the, the wonderful job it did for us. But w it was announced to us, I think, in 2014, that MQ for VSE was going to go end of life. So uh, we were that was one one big thing. We, we actually met with the, uh, the the fine folks who we have a tremendous relationship to this day with. At the uh, the Burbling and Lab, and they showed us their MQ connector and uh, and explained this doesn't mean you can't use MQ on VSE on VSE, and we knew that, but there were there were some other uh, other reasons that, that we um we we uh, we, we were uh, thinking of to to because uh, of reconsideration, uh, and and those were um 
that there's definitely a skill shortage in the VSE world. I saw some some folks talking about potential you know VSE education in the chat uh, over the last couple of days, and and I think I think that that would be worthwhile because VSE is still such an important part of many people's infrastructure. Um, but we tried to, we had a, uh, shortly before the conversion was decided, we had a, a long time uh, systems programmer uh, uh, take medical retirements and it was fairly unexpected. So we, we were, uh, we were in, in a position where we had to backfill his position. At the time we had two full time s systems programs working on VSE and then uh, some, some help from, from LRS uh, uh, for contracting work for, for support for them and then for myself on VM. But we, uh, it, it took us about six to eight months to, to really find anyone who, who could potentially fill that position. Um, and we only found two candidates. Uh, in the end, the, the person that we hired ended up working out very well for us. And he stuck with us all the way through the conversion. And then uh, he was actually approaching retirement age and took retirement um, uh, shortly after conversion took place. So uh, it was, it was kind of a, a an interesting uh, experience because we we it was, we'd, we realized that it was it was hard to backfill these positions and, and sure we can train from within. Um, I actually volunteered. I was like, I'll, I'll do VSE. That seems kind of interesting to me. My, my management was like, No, you focus on VM and Linux. You, you've got enough to do. Um, but uh, it was it was it was a challenge finding finding uh, people to fill those positions who had experience. And the other candidate who we did, didn't end up hiring, uh, a very skilled individual, but he hadn't been on the mainframe in about. 15 years at that point. So uh, it would have, there would have been a lot of retraining effort. Uh, one of the other things was, was the either real or perceived constraints of VSE. Uh, we, I would often go to, we would often go to, to conferences. Uh, luckily we have a very um, a good relationship uh, with my, well, I have a good relationship with my management and they, they, uh, they care very much about our uh, education, training and development. So I got to go to, to share a, a number of times. Uh, but I remember I was at uh, the Enterprise Conference in in Vegas, and I believe 2014, and I was walking around the trade show, and uh, one of the 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 sales guys came up to me, you know, the, you know the type, the slick slick sales types who want to sell you their product, uh, and I had a, a great trick up my sleeve up until this point. I was able to to say to most of them, you know, we're a VSE shop, and they'd leave me alone. Uh, but this guy clearly had been in the <clears throat> the mainframe. <clears throat> excuse me, the mainframe world a little bit uh, longer. And he's like, oh yeah, ZVSE, I get, I guess that is a thing. And and he kind of laughed in my face <laughs> because, uh, you know, we were essentially seen as small fry because they they didn't didn't have any services for VSE. So what that illustrates is is that, that the ISV choices, and we've seen this since we, we went to ZOS, uh, the ISV choices in the VSE world are definitely smaller. Um, and, uh, and even, even when you, we worked with, uh, one particular ISV who, whose products we ran on VSE and, uh, oftentimes we would, uh, open a PMR with them and, uh, the instructions we get back would be ZOS instructions. Uh, so, so it was, it was, it was a challenge. That was one of the challenges that we were running into. So we, we'd made this decision to, uh, migrate away from VSE and, and most of us in the systems area really knew that, that, that change was going to come, uh, the, the, the migration was going to go to VO, uh, to ZOS. Uh, but people above us decided, uh, well, we need to do a full fair evaluation of, of the alternatives. So, um, was there a distributed alternative? Um, we have a good amount of Intel and in architecture in, in our, in our shop as most people do. Uh, and also Linux on Intel. So there, there was a consideration, could we do Linux on Intel? Uh, is there a system that exists for that? We also have uh, tons of AIX administration, um, which is, uh, well, tons of AIX infrastructure, I should say. Um, we run a big Oracle rack cluster on on AIX. So uh, we had that infrastructure, we had the skills around it. it was, was there a potential for that? And, and then also we had to look at Windows because, you know, it, it exists, I guess. Uh, but then, you know, the other thing, uh, which is, is a buzzword that everybody's kind of talking about these days is is cloud. And could we look at some kind of hosted solution from one of the big cloud providers? And we evaluated all of that. But eventually, and I think it was the right move, and I'm sure most people listening think it was the right move, uh, it was decided that we would stay on, on the Z platform with all the historical investment we had in the Talon product and also the uh, scope of the conversion, you know, we were told by certain organizations that, that, you know, we can convert you to a distributed architecture, but all your code can stay the same. And we'd heard horror stories about people going through that before. So, so the wise decision in my view was made, 
Um, and it, you know, if we weren't going to stay on VSE, we were, we were going to migrate to ZOS. Um, uh, so what ended up happening was, uh, in 2015, September, 2015, we had a kickoff meeting. Um, and, uh, we met with, uh, we had IBM were, were there, a heavy, heavy representation from, from IBM. Um, we had, uh, developers obviously, uh, from, from our infrastructure and, uh, and then from also from our conversion partner. Uh, and then we had people like, uh, like myself, infrastructure folks, uh, who were, who were there representing kind of saying, this is a really big deal. We need to think about this and do this very carefully. Uh, computer op operations staff that their jobs were going to be changing uh, a fair amount because operations are different on ZOS and some of the changes, the modernization, and it's not the right word, but, but the, the, the changes we were making to, uh, to the, the operations and batch process were going to really affect them. And then we had people from the business side as well, um, coming in to make sure that we could keep the credit union running and also convert to a, to a, a a system that was going to be as as reliable, if not more reliable, than the one we were migrating off of. Um, and then our infrastructure conversion partner, uh, Sirius, were, were there. Um, uh, we also had some great support from LRS uh, in the VM and Linux sphere, especially, and also some some of the ZOS comm server stuff that I'll talk about later. Uh, but then also we had our application convert conversion partners from a, a company called ConvTech. ConvTech. I always pronounce that incorrectly. This, incidentally, this isn't at their actual logo. I went to their website looking for a logo, and they didn't have one. So since they did most of their work in like the eighties and nineties, I, I, I went, I went full eighties and nineties on their logo and just kind of made up, made up one myself. Um, but we spent a couple of days uh, discussing the the finer details of exactly what we were going to go to and the the detailed process of how we were going to get there and uh it was it was a lot and and my reaction was kind of this um i'm kidding of course it was it was immensely exciting but also a very daunting task you know not many people uh especially if of my age get to go through these sorts of conversions in their career these days because they're just not happening as much as they used to um but uh it was it was a, a definitely a a task that we realized was was uh, huge and, and daunting for sure. Um, so uh, let's talk about the application conversion real quick. First of all, disclaimer, I am not an application developer, so I might get things wrong. Uh, please don't 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 uh, yell at me in the chat or, or otherwise for, for getting things wrong about, about the application um, or any kind of application development language. Uh, as I mentioned it, 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 with, our his, with the history slide, we, we had and still have a lot of institutional understanding of the application. The, the, the depth of knowledge about the application is huge. Um, and we were really, it was really valuable as the conversion pro, uh, process went on to, to have that understanding because uh, they could work with our conversion partners and the conversion partners could, could uh, understand the bits that, that were maybe going wrong. Um, when we started working with them, they, uh, the, the conversion partners that is, they explained to us that they did a mass conversion of all code, uh, JCL assembler and COBOL. Um, and uh, that was a little surprising to me because I was thinking, well, wouldn't you want to take it in bite-sized chunks? But one thing that they explained was, well, that's how we started doing it. Uh, but what we ran into was, okay, we'll, we'll split the application up, say by, you know, like this part does mortgage processing and this part does online transactions. But once we got done with this, this one chunk, we'd realized that there were interdependencies between this and then also maybe dependencies to a, a component of the application that hadn't been converted yet. So we'd then go have to uh, go and have to uh, change the, the bit that we thought was completely converted again. So it became a nightmare of, of, of dependencies, co-requisites co and, and prerequisites for parts of the code. So what they decided fairly early on and had a lot of success with was this mass, mass conversion approach where they got all of the source code, ran it through their, their syntax converters, and then went back and fixed any problems that were, were, were uh, that presented themselves after that conversion took place. And there were some problems along the way. There was one fairly major component of, of the application. I don't really know what it does, but a, a component of the application that, that what, after it was converted and start, we started it up on uh, on ZOS, it would just spit messages to the console uh, and, and, and just throw errors constantly. And uh, they undertook a fairly major rewrite, so much so that they, they, they stuck a different letter on the first of the, the start of the name and, and rewrote an entire component of, of the uh, of the application so that it would run on 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 ZOS. 
Um, but uh, my part of, of the the application conversion was was code resupply. As I mentioned, you know, I was the CMS administrator, and all of our CMS, uh, all of our code was stored on CMS disks. So they were like, "You boy, uh, you're the guy to, to to resupply this the the code when they need it." So I developed a, a series of, of Rex execs. Oh, I, I said it says don't talk about SharePoint there because uh, the very first resupply we did, a lot of the infrastructure stuff wasn't in place. Um, and uh, we like we didn't have a ZOS system on site, uh, and uh, what we ended up doing was grabbing all of the code from CMS and uploading it to a SharePoint share, and we heard no end of complaints about how awful that was. And I understand it; it really wasn't very clean. Uh, so I ended up developing a, a number of Rex execs that would um, go through the, uh, the various disks where code was stored. And luckily for me, the uh, the application developers have been very disciplined with uh, file name and file types. Uh, standards. So I was able to to do a lot of masking in my Rex execs where, okay, I know this, that I, I need file types to start with these two letters. So I'm going to grab those, stage them on a disk, and 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 then uh, I ended up putting them all into a Vimpplec D image. Initially, they they, they wanted, uh, wanted it to go to physical tape, but I was like, surely it would be easier to just create a disk image and then FTP that over to to ZOS. And that's how we ended up doing it. And, uh, and, and it worked out, worked out pretty well for us. Um, it was, uh, it was kind of an, an interesting thing though, because it, what, what it gave me was, was, uh, a, it helped me expand my Rex skills because they were milling to best, uh, at best at the time. Uh, and also, um, it gave me the opportunity to, to work in CMS more up to this point. I'd worked in CMS a, a decent amount, but it was mainly with hypervisor administration. This was kind of, kind of, uh, digging more into the classic end of things, which was, was, uh, exciting to me. Uh, and as you can see, the, the first the first delivery, um, one one of the execs that I wrote, kind of kept track of the deliveries uh, version controlled, uh, was uh, was uh, at October twenty first of, of twenty fifteen, um, and I put in this little uh, little part that that put who did the delivery because I was thinking, well, if someone else does it, then we need to know so we can go back. But it ended up all being me. I think we did sixteen deliveries in total uh, over over the the period of the conversion. So uh, let's talk a little bit about VM and Linux. Uh, this is the VM workshop after all. Uh, we, we had a couple of decision points. Uh, one of them was um, when we were building the new golden image, do we do Slash 12 or do we stick with Slash 11? Uh, uh, Slash 12 have been GA for a little while at this point. So we decided we, we, we decided to evaluate it. But those of you who are Linux people know that between Slash 11 and Slash 12, there was a fairly major change. And that change was the init system, the thing that starts up all the services and manages them. Uh, and it went from uh, the, the traditional sysv init to, uh, to system D. And that, that brought some, some challenges with it. And it was essentially, uh, eventually decided that we needed to kind of stick with what we knew for now, because the conversion was, was uh, scheduled to be done by 2017, although we, we extended a little while. And we had GA support of SLES 11 through 2019. So we had a good amount of time after the project was done to maybe start moving to, to SLES 12, which we've now done. So I think it was the right decision in the end. We did, however, during the project go from VM 6.2 to 6.3. Uh, we, um, we we made that migration choice because uh, 6.2 essentially went off support while we were while we were doing the uh, the conversion project, and we built um, those uh, both the, the Linux and VM systems uh, from. Uh, from new installations rather than doing a migration of the existing systems. And, and there were several reasons for that. Uh, we wanted to kind of get rid of any architect, uh, artifacts, for, historical artifacts that might have been in there that, uh, that might have uh, been negatively impacting to us. Uh, but a lot of migration was done to bring over a lot of the good stuff that, that, we, uh, that we had on the previous systems as well. Uh, we were able to build that new, uh, slightly more stripped down uh, Linux golden image though, and that was, that was definitely a benefit. Uh, there were a couple of exceptions as far as that goes. Uh, most of the, the Linux systems were built from fresh and the applications installed uh, and new because uh, there was there were significant enough changes in uh, the back end that it was talking to. And also the infrastructure that we were going into, we simplified the network fairly significantly and uh, did a lot of name, sta name change standards. So the work to rework those old guests was gonna be uh, equal to, if not exceeding that of, uh, of just building it from scratch. Uh, ATM systems, um, that's a, a sunsetted application. So we, uh, we didn't wanna do a reinstall of that from fresh. So those were, those were, were actually um, global, mirror, global mirrored over to the new uh, disk subsystem. 
we did also implement RACF for CVM. This was primarily because uh, during uh, the conversion, I think it was share in San Jose, it may have been San Antonio, um, the, the VM uh, MFA, which you, a great presentation on yesterday, MFA for VM was announced and we were having a hard requirement of, of, of multi-factor authentication in ZOS. So we were like, okay, let's now's the time to pull the trigger on, on RACF um, for uh, for VM, and uh, we'd been a Dermate shop for a long, long time. Um, and I remember fairly early on in my VM ca career uh, at the credit union, I found the uh, the, the password uh, complexity and ex expiration exit for 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 CP. And uh, I mentioned it in one of our meetings that we had, uh, what we called our monthly coordination meeting. And my VP was actually sat right next to me. And I, I said that, and there was grumbling around the rooms, like, oh, I'm going to have to change my CMS pers password now. And I, I can tell you tell you when it was because um, my, uh, my 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 VP said I've had that password for thirty years, and I just turned to him and I said, "You realize your password's older than me, right?" And uh, and he told me to shut up uh, with, a, with a wry smile on his face. But uh, it was uh, it, it was time. So so to those of you familiar with VM uh, logins, kind of went from looking like this to looking like this uh, over the period of the conversion. So let's talk a little bit about hardware. I showed you the infrastructure diagram uh, before. Uh, this is how our infrastructure looked after the conversion uh, was com was complete. And we're still running on, on the Z13. Uh, we've had some, some capacity upgrades uh, in the meantime. Um, but we, we, st we uh, purchased a Z13 that, that sat on the data center floor in parallel to our EC12. And that's where all the development effort took place. Um, uh, there, there was some decision by management where they wanted to have the strict physical separation of ZOS and VSC so that there wouldn't be any potential for cross-contamination. And, and it, it, you know, you could call that overkill, but it worked out pretty well for us. So it was a, a Z13 model 603. Uh, we had four IFLs initially, although we only activated a single IFL for the vast majority of the uh, the conversion period just so that we could run Linux workload. But, but given the fact we weren't running transactions and it was just sitting there idle, we just had a single IFL until we started doing load testing, and then we activated all four. Uh, but we also added um, a, a pair of ICFs uh, for the coupling facility LPARs that we defined, and then uh, a, a zip engine because we knew that uh, a DB2 was going to start uh, start to be part of our future. We had 320 uh, gig of storage on that machine initially. Uh, we, we're far in excess of that now. Um, and then the same four ZVM LPAR layout as, as I showed previously, and then uh, four ZOS LPARs. Uh, in addition to the, the four ZOS LPARs, which was uh, uh, two for test, two for production, uh, and the, those are in, in parallel sysplex, defined as parallel sysplexes, we also have a, a pair of sandbox LPARs. Uh, they're now in, in native LPARs for, for various different reasons. It's, it's good to have kind of parity across all, all of the environments. Um, so that's the same, but those ran under VM until about uh, two months ago, actually, um, uh, in a virtual parallel sysplex, and then uh, for coupling facilities. So as you can see, our ZOS uh, system consisted of Kix, uh, Kix TS 5.2, which uh, were a big Kix shop. Our application is a Kix application, uh, newer versions of MQ, and then Com Server and RankF and the Vanguard suite of, of uh, security um, enhancements and productivity uh, facilities. Um, which I'll talk about in, in a little bit. And then uh, 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 VM and Linux architecture really didn't change a whole lot, except for the fact we're now running on uh, IIB 10, um, although at the conversion time we were running on uh, Message Broker version 8 still. Uh, external co connectivity changed, changed a decent amount as well. Uh, we went to a pair of uh, DS8870s. We used the the, the quote-unquote old DS8870 that we were using for VSE, and created Metro Global Mirror relationship with that. So we've got on-site redundancy um, and then also still Global Mirror to our, our backup data center. Um, and then added some FICON connections to that and we're also on FICON 16 now. As I mentioned on a previous slide, we simplified our network infrastructure significantly and ended up uh, with 10 gigos. Uh, but rather than having, we had a kind of a, a what I would describe as, as kind of uh, organic subnet growth um, and some se some separation that really didn't need to be there. Uh, I, I'd, I'd, I'd inherited this uh, the previous infrastructure and kind of made some assumptions along the way because of, of some of the traffic that was going across some of these extra OSs that we had. And through some investigation, found out that it really was unnecessary. So we now have uh, a single uh, Ethernet subnet for production and test, which has really simplified things nicely for us. And also implemented things like OSPF, uh, option shortest path first, um, for, uh, for 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 ZOS and link aggregation for 
uh, v v VM. So we really we took a step up on our network configuration, definitely. We also purchased a virtual tape subsystem, which is uh, currently on its way out of, out of the door. We, we're replacing that with a uh, another system, a, a, a product that's uh, allowing us to to really kind of uh, save save not only some money but also modernize uh, that infrastructure. Um, also connected by FICON 16. And then we kept around uh, the prism, uh, although uh, off support at that point, just in case we needed to read in any of those deep archive tapes that might not have been converted during the tape conversion to the uh, the virtual tape subsystem. Uh, so a few more details about the conversion and some of the areas that I took care of. And and comm server was one of them. I, as far as in-house uh, skill went, I, I probably had on the mainframe team, at least, the, the most um, understanding, certainly not as, as from the credit union as a whole, but I had the most experience with doing networking in, in my background of Linux and uh, and Windows administration in the past. So um, uh, comm server was kind of given to me and myself and, and Sam Cohen from LRS kind of uh, kind of double teamed building out the, the comm server administration. But one of the things that I started running to was, was comm server has, because of its SNA past, has a lot of uh, of things of, of terms and definitions that really didn't make sense to me. So I started learning about things like VTAM apples, and then we got to the point of configuring uh, TCP/IP, and you can do it a couple of ways in ZOS. There's the new interface statements, which we ended up going with, which kind of put everything in a single stanza, or there was the device and link statements, and they didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, but one of the things that we really got to do, uh, I know that VSE can support it, but we'd never implemented security in 3270 in our environment. And fairly early on, we were able to do that. So that was definitely a step up. And it was a step up not only for things like TSO logins and uh, and the administration side of things and development side of things, but also for the uh, remaining components of our application that still run a 3270 interface. The vast majority of our application interface uh, fr from our, 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 uh, a staff perspective is done through a... Uh, GUI applications, um, but we still have an application called Flex, um, and Flex is a, a really important part of the credit union's uh, 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 operations because a lot of the backend uh, departmental stuff is done done in Flex still. This isn't it. I actually originally had a Flex screenshot in here, but my management was like, ah, "You probably shouldn't put that." So this is actually my my uh, logo screen for my level two system. Um, but uh, one of the troubles we, we ran into when we first got Flex stood up, when we first got Talon stood up on ZOS was we ran into this situation of double logons. Um, in uh, VSC, there had been a, 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 like a pass-through given to this particular, like if you connected to VSC on a certain port, we, we ran the CSI uh, stack, uh, TCP IP stack on, on VSC. And uh, they defined it, the VSC sysprogs had done an excellent job of defining that so that if you connected on a certain port, you got sent through to the application and you were presented with an application log on screen rather than the basic security manager log on screen. Uh, but we didn't have that in ZOS, so we had to go and figure it out. Um, and, and there was some internal discussion actually. Uh, uh, some people were like, well, they should have to do a rack if log on. That means we can see who's coming in and it's much more secure. And yeah, sure, but it would have been a usability nightmare uh, because those credentials certainly couldn't have been in sync. Uh, we, as I said, we implemented security in 30 to 70 for the first time for our, for this application, which was a, a big a big success. And uh, we, we defined it in the end with a, a distinct port per environment. Our test environments, we have uh, multiple different levels of, of, uh, of, of code running and multiple different kicks regions with the application running in, in our test environment. So I defined a, a port with a with different begin VTAM statements um, and, uh, and uh, on, on various ports for the various environments. And uh, the uh, default Apple for those those environments in the TN3270 profile matches the kicks, um, the kicks environment where the kicks AOR where each of those environment works. But I had to kind of start learning and digging into these uh, these kicks definitions. I'd never done them before, so I got got to use the CDA transaction a good amount uh, and define type terms and and terminals for for the uh, for, for the for the application so that people could log in. And this was all brand new to me, so it was exciting to get my hands on it, but it was all pretty new. Um, and then we we ran into an issue with the type term statements because the, uh, the the terminal type definition sample member in ZOS was kind of out of date. So we went went to ZO, Z, Z, uh, VSC and and kind of stole that definition and moved that over, and uh, that ended up working nicely for some some characters that that were specific to the application. Talk a little bit about RACF now. Um, the official definition of RACF is resource access and, and control facility, and I know that these days it's called the ZOS security server, but everyone still calls it RACF. 
Um, but but I once I started getting on my hands on my hands on it, I, I had a different definition for it, and that was really confusing and hard to figure out. And of course, IBM stands for I bring manuals, so I started diving into those manuals, um, and start started to learn learn RACF. And I, I I volunteered to do RACF because of some of the security background I had within forensics. But it's it's a it's a big test to to, to take on. Uh, but there's many benefits. Um, we we're finally able to to do password complexity enforcement. We had that in VM. Um, but ended up uh, n never having that in in VSE. We did have expiration, but not not complexity enforcement. As I mentioned, we we're able to do multi-factor authentication, and and that that's now available for VM, and uh, it was available around the same time for ZOS. But we ended up going with the Vanguard solution because uh, they were able to work with our token provider much more quickly than IBM. Unfortunately, the, the the very nature of IBM being this you know this big kind of slow lumbering ship with a lot of bureaucracy, they weren't able to give us a guarantee that by the time we got to production. Our token provider, which is Duo Security, was going to be supported by the, the MFA solution, although now it is. Um, and then it also provided separation of duties. Uh, historically, uh, systems programming teams had been uh, uh, just done everything, uh, and this able to, to kind of separate, allowed us to separate that. And then the internal data security definitely increased vastly. Uh, we're doing things like pervasive encryption now to, to really uh, step that up even further, but uh, uh, that was definitely one of the benefits of having, having RACF. There were some drawbacks, though. Um, we had limited in-house understanding. Like I said, I volunteered to t kind of take care of it, but I I'd never really touched it before. Um, and uh, uh, one of uh, our newer members of systems programming staff, who's now our team lead, he had RACF administration, but he didn't really know the shop. So uh, we worked, worked together to really kind of uh, gain that understanding. And then there's no doubting that uh, the increased complexity is, is there. Uh, I know I'm kind of running a little bit low on time, but I'm, I'm just going to go through... A uh, little bit about our ATMs and point of sale system and how that was converted. Um, so before we converted, I mentioned it was a sunsetted application, but it's still actively supported and we have a good relationship with the vendor. Um, it use, used and still uses, in fact, SNA transactions, um, SNA to send transactions to, to Talon. Um, but there was a thousand base T OSE device that we that, uh, we had connected to send that SNA traffic over. Uh, and that that traffic ended up at a protocol, protocol conversion server, which was off platform was on, on AIX. So here's what that looked like. Uh, transactions came in via TCP IP to our Linux application server. They would then go on that thousand base T copper ethernet infrastructure, uh, which, sorry, they go over fiber via TCP IP to comm server on AIX. That protocol conversion would take place in, in a, a product called NetX. And then it would come back out of the AIX box on a different connection on copper, uh, you, uh, on an LU6, using LU62 over SNA, and then come into VTAM on VSE, uh, and then eventually make it into Kix. So some of the challenges we faced with this was we had a lot of lost knowledge. When this had been put into place, it just kind of sat there and did its job for, for a lot of years, but there wasn't a great deal of knowledge transfer to, to either our systems administration or pro system programming staff or our ATMs administration staff um, on how this particular uh, infrastructure, they knew how the applications worked, but this this uh, the configuration of this, particularly in Kix and VTAM, wasn't well understood. So I had to take on the Kix definitions, and Sam and I, again, we, we kind of double teamed this and managed to reverse engineer it and figure it out. And then also define the VTAM uh, definitions to, to make sure that we had the, the, um, the, the devices set up. Both on the AIX side, in fact, we, we were able to look and kind of reverse engineer from the production uh, AIX server that was servicing VSE uh, and figure, figure some of that out and get those con uh, connections um, really put into place. But one of the things that we decided to do, and it was a slight change, was implement Enterprise Extender. So what that really meant was this, this SNA LU62 and 1000 base T requirement went away on both ends. So we no longer needed an OS, OSE, which is additional complexity on the mainframe, and we no longer needed this, uh, this, uh, this additional infrastructure in between that provides a, a really critical operation. So uh, for those who don't know, Enterprise Extender essentially encapsulates SNA traffic into UDP packets so that you can transmit it uh, uh, using uh, TCP IP. Uh, so it now goes over those shared fiber OSAs, and that was definitely a benefit to us, and it's been very stable and secure ever, ever since we did that. Uh, so uh, one of the other major things that I took care of was firewall rules. Uh, again, I'm still running, I'm running very short on time. I did time this, but I'm, I'm definitely running short on time now. Um, uh, one of the things that, that uh, I had to do was was uh, go through the firewall rules. We got early on, we, we got 
uh, told by our, our systems and network security team that they wanted strict separation because we were planning on plugging the Z13 into, into what was going to be production gear. They they essentially put a firewall, a hardware firewall in between us and the rest of the network with a default denial rule in place, which meant that any communication that needed to go to the new Z13 environment, VM, Linux, or ZOS, was, uh, was, had to be defined explicitly. So we ended up with around 500, a little over 500 rules built by the end and uh, more than 9,400 objects, uh, which related to hosts. And part of the problem was, uh, it was it was fully understood by nobody because uh, requests would go through a normal file request pro uh, process, be put into place by one of the, the probably five or six guys on the firewall team, and then, uh, then essentially forgotten because they were working. And in the checkpoint file, firewalls that we had, a lot of the time, arbitrary labels would be applied to that. When I started getting a look at these rules, uh, it was the des description of, of the file, the rule submitter was taken. And, and in retrospect, we probably should have had a single point of, of control for that, but we didn't. Um, uh, so I had to go through and, and examine them all. And this took, no kidding, about 40 hours of, of really concerted work to go through all of those, those rules. Uh, let me just repeat, I examined them all. It was a long, long task. Um, and what one of the things we wanted to eliminate was test production cross contamination. Um, we ended up, uh, thankfully, not not causing any of that by the time that we were done with this rule review. But we had a lot of rules that were fine because uh, during the conversion, it was a, several years that we were like, well, we didn't want to build another production system, or we don't want a, uh, something in production that could cross contaminate with the VSE. So particularly databases that they, they, we, we pointed to test infrastructure, and we didn't want to have that when we went to production. Um, we had very few missed rules on the conversion night, just a couple that, that, that got missed that went into place, but nothing nothing that, that did this, which is what we wanted to avoid. Um, in the end, uh, anyone who was trying to come in and, and uh, do, do something bad looked more like this. So let me just talk quickly about conversion night. Uh, September the 9th, 2018, uh, we had uh, tons of people uh, from all departments involved to make sure that everything went smoothly and, and it was tested and working. Uh, we had a very detailed step-by-step -step action plan, and it took around 12 to 14 hours of effort. This is one of our infrastructure uh, conversion partner guys, uh, sales sales guys, on the morning of conversion, looking a little bit sleepy. Uh, there are a few hiccups along the way. Um, we had a, an issue with data power that that we had a crit raised with IBM, but managed to get through that before production. Um, and the credit union woke up to what appeared to be a non-event, which is exactly what we wanted. We were we were terrified that we would we would wake up and there would be a, an issue and people would be complaining and there would, we wouldn't be able to service members. But what we went, woke up to was like, well, well what was a big deal? Uh, you know, nothing looks nothing looks any different, and that's exactly what we wanted. And you can see that little mothership logo there. We refer to the the mothership uh, the, the the mainframe as the mothership internally. So we we had this little logo commissioned by. Uh, our, um, uh, our, our marketing department, and they, they put, uh, we, we put that together. I'm actually wearing it right now. Um, so a couple of post-conversion findings, then I'll shut up. Um, the application runs way more quickly now. Um, we, we were running consistently at 80 to 95% uh, uh, CPU utilization in, in the application owning region of Kix on VSC, and now we run between 14 and 20% even on a busy day. So uh, that was definitely a benefit for us. We have vastly increased ISV choices. That's definitely true, but with that comes cost and complexity and uh, spam emails. Um, the the, the it, it's, well, just to go back to the, the first first point, it, it's kind of hard to do a, a configuration, a, a, a like for like comparison between VSE and ZOS, but uh, it definitely is is uh, running more efficiently. It seems uh, the the security enhancement potentials are, are massive. Um, our Linux workload is only increasing over time. As I, as I mentioned before, we converted our, our, to a DevOps environment now, GUI, uh, um, ISV, um, uh, what do I want to say, uh, IDE environment for our developers, and that all runs on Linux on Z. Um, and we have room to grow because of, of some of the available features and, and uh, facilities uh, from um, uh, from ZOS, but the skill shortage is still a thing. We, we got very lucky with hiring, uh, the Brian, who's our, our team lead, uh, fairly early on in the project, but we struggled to recruit uh, an experienced ZOS systems programmer. And we've now got a, a really great team, but it, it definitely took a while. Um, and we have an increased personnel need. As I mentioned, we had two permanent VSE, uh, systems programmers before uh, we're up to a team of five now and, and still growing. And with complexity comes new challenges, right? Uh, we, we, we're implementing things like pervasive encryption and 
uh, the, the application is growing and things like DB2 are coming into place and, and, and those new challenges are definitely, uh, definitely there. Um, but it's, it's, it's been, it's been, it's been a, a very successful conversion, uh, but, uh, definitely with, with its, its share of challenges. And I'm really glad to be a part of it. And now I'm definitely over time. Uh, I'm going to shut up, but if there are any questions, please, please feel free to, uh, please feel free to ask. Gerard, thank you again for another great presentation. Um, everyone, the floor is open for questions. Please unmute yourself and, and ask away. We've got a couple minutes to take questions. Uh, Gerald, did you consider any alternative ESMs uh, when you chose RACF? Uh, like you know, secure? You know uh, we actually we actually didn't. Um, I, I I knew of VM Secure uh, and and the the alternatives on VM um, when we when we made the conversion when we had the choice to go to, to Rack F, but it was essentially made the decision was made above my head to uh, keep in parity with ZOS, given the fact that we knew that we were converting to Rack F on ZOS, and that decision was made uh, again before uh, before I got involved. Um, we we decided well let's keep those those the same so that we can we can have kind of equivalent skills roughly speaking although that being said um my RACF environment in in vm doesn't change anywhere near as much as my zos environment does and i don't have the kind of uh, tools that i do to to administer that as i do in zos uh so every time i go in to make a change in in uh, in in vm rack for vm i'm almost cracking the manual because i can't remember the syntax because i've got i've got the, the vanguard front end to, to generate all of that for me but yeah unfortunately not we didn't we didn't um we didn't have a chance to evaluate any of those alternatives although i, I know a lot of them are very good and a lot of people like them that's great any other questions Do feel free to shoot me an email or, or uh, just get in touch uh, in the chat if you'd like to, if you, if you do have more questions um, or...